Shalom. Unlike the theological hell, the hell of physics offers you, is willing to offer you some precious gifts in return for those things which it wants you to abandon. Next one. So before we give up determinism, objectivity, locality, all those things which made classical physics so powerful, let's relish one beautiful idea in classical physics. Think about waves. So complex, so enormous, so beautiful. And if you, if you give up the mathematical details, then cl f classical physics tells you something beautiful about waves. When they merge together, they can merge in such a way that will give rise to constructive interference, that is, stronger waves, or no waves at all. Two waves can obliterate one another, or once again, constructive interference. That's all you need to know in order to be ready to go into hell, but this is the hell of physics. Uh, in one of the most famous and beautiful his, uh, experiments in the history of classical physics, Thomas Young showed that just as in water waves you can see interference, that is, waves obliterating or enha enhancing one another, the same thing goes with light, and you have shadow and light, which was a very strong proof that light indeed is uh, composed of waves. Let's go to a more advanced uh, device. Let's think about this source of light shedding, sending a ray of light into a half-silvered, half-transparent mirror such that the light is split into two half-rays. Then you have two solid mirrors, and these two solid mirrors reflect back the light into another half-silvered mirror such that you have destructive interference on the left and constructive interference on the right. So you have 100% of the light going to the right, nothing to the left. This is good old interference, constructive on one side and destructive on the other. Now, let's go quantum, and here is the surprise. The whole thing works also when you have single photons, that is, single particles of light. This is what Einstein got the Nobel Prize for it and hated the Nobel Prize committee for that for the rest of his life. <laughs> Amazingly, if you put two detectors on the two possible paths of a single photon, always one of them clicks, which means that there was one photon, never half a photon, on that side, zero on the other, or conversely, zero on this side, nothing, uh, and one on the other, it is only when you remove them in which you see, again, interference. So this is all very nice. If you are confused, don't worry, because soon it will turn out that the same thing that you see, something which is capable of going on both sides like a wave or being detected in only one side as a particle, goes also with what? Photons, we know, single photons, single electrons, single neutrons, atoms, molecules, you name it, all those small things are subject to the same duality of waves and particles, which means that in some crazy wave, some crazy way, they can go like a wave. So can we outsmart? This is actually the uncertainty principle. Can we outsmart it? Well, a very smart person tried to do that, which was Einstein, and he said, how about placing two detectors which will not absorb the photon, let's do it, they will only indicate whether it went on the right or on the left. Niels Bohr tried it and said, yeah, go ahead, you can do that. On 50% of the cases, the right-hand detector will click, which means that that photon took the right path, which means that it did not take the left path, but then it means that you will have no interference. Rather than this clean uh, pattern of interference, you have now the same probability of the photon ending on the left detector or on the right detector. Conversely, for the other possibility, the left side detector may click, which may indicate that the photon took the right, left side, but then nothing on the right side, and then once again, there is no interference. It is only when you give up any detection that the whole thing emerges again, and you see superposition, and you see interference, as you can see. So, can we outsmart the which path uncertainty 
No, we can't, but we gain something very precious in return by quantum mechanics. Our ancients used to say that knowledge means power. Here is a case in which ignorance may, means power. This is a case in which it is not only we who are ignorant about the particle. The particle itself does not know whether it is on the right and on the left. And this is a very powerful form of ignorance. Uh, this was used, for example, in a, what people believe to be a powerful experiment. The experiment of the bomb in which suppose that you have a super sensitive bomb you, which you would like to know whether it can explode or not but on the other hand you don't want to test it in a way in which it will explode it is the most sensitive bomb possible so by classical physics and by logic you can't do that but by this experiment it turns out that you can verify that a certain bomb is completely capable of exploding without exploding it this is something that quantum mechanics allows you to do I am Elitzur, and you would expect me to discuss the elitzur weidmann experiment. I have a better idea. Read about it in the internet, and let's go for something more advanced. So we go back, so we go back to this idea that ignorance is power, and we go to this good man, who hated quantum mechanics so much. Superposition in an, is another way of talking about ignorance. He so much hated it that he tried to knock it down with some very shrewd arguments. Much to his dismay, he found out that in quantum mechanics, every time that you try to knock out some monster, a much worse monster comes up, and from superposition came non-locality. Let's see how he did that. Once again, I shall begin with classical physics. Imagine that I have two coins, and I shake them. You know what are the coins, but I shake them and stretch I have one coin in each hand, I stretch my hands, you don't know which coin is in each hand, then I open one hand, you see which coin is there, and immediately you know which coin is in the other hand. Nothing crazy about that, this is completely classical. Let's see. So, conservation laws promise me that I'll never get 20 shekels from what I, I wish I could, but I'll never get more money than what I inserted, and conversely, if I see half a shekel here, I know that I'll have 10 shekels here. Nothing surprising so far, but here comes quantum mechanics. Say Einstein, if you really believe that there is such a thing as superposition, such a thing as nature itself being ignorant, how about a particle which, about which we are ignorant, whether it is still a spin up or spin down? We have two such particles coming from the atom, and if one is up, we know that the other is down. Now, for me, said Einstein, there is nothing surprising about that. They decided in advance when they left the atom which of them will be up and which will be down. If you believe in quantum mechanics, then you believe, you have to believe that the measurement forced the particle to assume one of the two values, but that means that it forced the other distant particle to, uh, to assume the opposite value. Now, who can say such a thing to Einstein when you talk about simultaneity of events? Then he will ask you whether you have any problem with the theory of relativity, and you don't want to be in such a state when Einstein is in the neighborhood. So, this is the other possibility, and here is the quantum mechanics, quantum mechanical um, paradox. The Einstein Podolsky wrote an experiment. Later came a genius called John Stuart Bell, who unfortunately died prematurely, and with a very shrewd and quite simple mathematics, showed a way in which you can ask the, two, uh, the particles, each particle, one out of three questions about which you decide at the last moment. And then if you do that, it turns out the conclusion, mathematical conclusion shows that there couldn't be any pre-established agreement between the two particles. They have to use some kind of telepathy. Each of them has to know which measurement was uh, applied to the other particle in order to know when it should be correlated and when should it be anti-correlated. <coughs> this is a very famous experiment and this is the dynasty to which I have the honor of belonging and this man in the middle who had have some interesting ideas about time such as, yeah, he says that. And we believe that when I did my PhD with him that the Error of causality can sometimes go backwards. So here is what I did with my PhD student at that time. 
Shachar Dolev, and we propose the following thing together with Anton Zeilinger. This is the EPR experiment. So you have the atom from which two electrons come. The entangling event is in the past, and you do the measurement in the, in the present. How about an inverse EPR in which the entangling event is in the future? Here are two atoms, one of which may send a photon to a detector, and here you have an interesting situation. In the ordinary EPR, you have entanglement by common past, by something in the past, by a common source, and here you have an entanglement by something which is in the future, by the destination of the particles. Once we did that, we noticed a very, should I say, stunning paradox, and here it goes. This is a well-known statement. It is famous because the man who said it gave rise to the following paradox. Just try to believe this, to this <laughs> statement and you run into a paradox. And we found out that quantum mechanics may be caught cheated, cheating in a similar way. When we took Bell's exercise to prove non-locality and switched the third question and replaced it. With what? This is the quantum liar paradox. Rather than asking whether the spin of that particle is up or down, we found a way to ask whether it is at all entangled with the other. Whether at all this particle has this kind of strange relationship which Einstein found out to exist between two correlated particles. What do you know? In 50% of the cases, the particle has to say, no, I am not correlated with it, which is a bit strange, because by Bell's inequality, it turns out that the very decision of that particle to say, I am not entangled with the other particle, I don't have a non-local correlation with the other particle, is due to an entanglement with the particle. Here is how we do that. Two atoms which are excited. One of them, we don't know which, sends a photon which is absorbed by that detector. Now we are in that kind of bliss ignorance to which we strive. We don't know whether the right-hand atom is now ex ground in a ground state. That is, this is the atom which gave that photon. Or it could be that the left-hand atom is now grounded, the other is excited. Remember? Ignorance is power in this case. Once you don't know which of these atoms is the atom which gave, which contributed that photon, they are correlated now. And they will do what Einstein predicted, that is, they are in a telepathic communication with one another. And then you can ask them, did you contribute that photon? And in some of the cases it says, no, look, I'm still in an excited state. The other guy is in a ground state. I didn't contribute any photon. I cannot be entangled with the other photon, with the other atom. So what do we have? This is the EPR. This is by Bell inequality, we show that this is non-local. And here is what we have. One of the atoms is found to be excited, which seems to indicate that it emit has emitted no photon. It should not be correlated. There shouldn't be any interaction that we know of, neither in the past nor in the future, between that atom and the other atom. <laughs> But by violating Bell's inequality, it's having preserved its photon, means that it somehow talked with the other one before they established any contact between them. Which is equivalent to saying this sentence has never been written. Now there is something special about this paradox. We know many paradoxes. We know back, back, back. We know many paradoxes in quantum mechanics, the EPR paradox, Schrodinger's paradox. These paradoxes have to do with a contradiction between quantum mechanics and relativity theory, or between quantum mechanics and classical physics. This, to my knowledge, is the first paradox in which the contradiction is within quantum mechanics itself. It is one theory which tells you a story which is inconsistent within itself, which is kind of self-contradictory. And to the best of our knowledge, this is a new situation. How can we explain that? First of all, let me make a distinction. The paradox is there. I hope that just like the, the bomb testing experiment which was carried out after Weidmann and myself predicted it, 
somebody will take this experiment and perform it. There is something beautiful about quantum mechanics, and this is that everything that works on the paper eventually works in the lab, no matter how crazy it is. So we are waiting for this experiment to turn into a real experiment. Until then, how should we explain it? In order to do that, let me take you to the Bolshoya Sovietskaya Encyclopedia in one of the old editions and point out something strange in that encyclopedia. The entry, there is time order here, the entry of Bering Sea is very extended in this encyclopedia. And you may wonder, why should the great Soviet encyclopedia give such a long description of the Bering Sea? In order to understand that, you have to go to earlier editions of that encyclopedia in which you will find this nice gentleman, Lavrenti Berge, who was the head of the KGB or Cheka or whatever, and his job was to kill as many people as he could all over the Soviet Union. Along came Khrushchev and realized that in order to survive, he has to liquidate this guy. Now, what do you do with those uh, volumes of the Soviet encyclopedia which discuss so extensively this hero of the people in the time of Stalin? No problem, you go to all the houses, nicely request that volume, take out those pages. Now, what do you do with the num missing numbers? You just expand the other entry, which is Bering C, <laughs> and everything returns to be nice and peaceful, and history is now perfect. Now, is it possible? that just like the Soviet encyclopedia's version of history that says that sometimes you can affect the past, sometimes you can rewrite it, is it possible that quantum mechanics is so strange because it is doing something similar with respect to time? Is it possible that quantum mechanics is so strange because something about space and time is still ill understood? So, this is our hypothesis, whether it is correct or not, we shall have for time to tell us. Uh, but let me say the following, and with this, with which I shall end, to the end. Hermann Minkowski was Einstein's teacher, and when he died prematurely, he said this very moving, he made this very moving statement. What a, what a pity to die at the dawn of relativity. Now, the dawn of relativity is long ago over, but there is always a new dawn waiting for us. And I wish all of you that it will always be a pity for you to die and that we'll, there will always be a new dawn to look for. Thank you very much.